So I want to talk to you guys about something that's very, very real. I'm going to try to see how much of my personal life I can include you guys on. So I had this quick vision in my mind uh, right before I decided to, t to communicate the word of God to you all this evening. And I just had this idea or it just entered my mind where the Lord was like, just, just give me your hand. And it's interesting how God gets so real um, to us that sometimes we can interact with him like someone who is just as tangible and visible to us. And so as I was sitting on my couch and I was meditating on the Lord, it's as if he asked me to uh, extend my hand out. Like he wanted to put something in my hand. And when when I got the thought, like, put your hand out real quick. I have something for you. It's, it's similar to like when someone has something behind their backs and they're like, close your eyes. And you're like, what? What do you have? What do you have? And I thought to myself about how my husband likes to do those types of things. And I'm always like, yo, I don't like surprises. I don't, I don't want to play that game because, you know, you might want to be funny today and put some kind of worm or something in my hand and, I'll, and I'm not gonna find that to be pleasant. And so, but it's a surprise and it's supposed to excite you and it's supposed to make you feel close to the, to the giver as you receive, as the recipient. And it was as if I was sitting on the, on the couch and the Lord was like, give me your hand. And so I, I just kind of bashfully extended my hand out and although I didn't see anything in the physical, what I believed is that the Lord deposited something in my hand because I was willing to trust that he is good. And I was willing to receive whatever he would have for me because I know he's my father and he loves me. So whatever he's going to put in my hand, it wouldn't be anything silly like a friend or, or a sibling or a spouse would do when they feel like jesting and, and do something that's going to upset you for a moment. I know that him asking me to extend my hands out is a sign of faith and a sign of the, of the fact that I trust him. And, and the fact that I can believe in God without even seeing him physically and even hearing his voice like I do and respond that way, it just shows the nearness and the closeness of our relationship that God wants to build in every single believer. And the demonstration can be as simple as, I just wanted to see if you were gonna do it. I just wanted to see if you trust me. I just wanna see if you're obedient. I just wanna know if, you're, if, you, or if, if you want what I have and do you believe I can give good things. It could be a variety of things that God wants to see as he asks us to do certain things that may feel silly or, 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 or insignificant in the moment, but when you could remember that he's God and he created me, I didn't create him. And he chose me. I didn't choose him. And the best thing about all of it is that he loved me first. I love him because he first loved me. And so to have these communications with God and these interactions with God, when he can ask me to do something that might make me feel like I'm out of my comfort zone, but yet I, I hold on to the fact that, you know, he's good. And I think I, wanna, I want to entertain his holiness and his righteousness and his sovereignty right now by just giving myself over to him. And so I literally just sat there by myself and I didn't feel stupid. I didn't feel insane or anything like that. And I just, I just stretched forth my hand with a smile on my face. And although I didn't feel anything, I didn't see anything. I don't have anything. So it seems, I believe that God rewarded that, that God rewarded that act of faith in the name of Jesus. So there's a scripture in Romans chapter eight that came to my mind as I was having that brief interaction with God. And I, and I thought it was a, a very good scripture that simultaneously coincided with the act. And it's the scripture that says, um, I'm gonna start at verse 24, but I'm gonna emphasize Yes, verse 24 and 25. It says, so in Romans 8, 24 and 25, if you have your sword, you want to read along with me and declare these words out loud in your atmosphere along with me, I encourage you all to do that. So, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. 
for what a for what a man sees why does he yet hope but if we hope for that we see not then we um then do we with patience wait for it likewise the spirit also helps our infirmities for we know not what we should pray as we ought to pray but the spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered so my emphasis is we are saved by hope the hope that the lord is strong to be my redeemer the hope that god loves me even if i might have lived a hard life even if i might have not experienced sincere love sometimes we can have tragic tragic experiences like parents that just do not know how to love their children you might be someone that grew up under that experience where people didn't love you as they should have this is not to take away from any one of our experiences but this is just to promote god highly higher than life in the life that we have lived outside of his sovereignty so, you know, a lot of us can experience brokenheartedness. Some of us can experience infidelity. Some of us can feel and have gone through abandonment and rejection. And it's real. It's real. It happened. It was what it was and has impacted us in a lot of ways. You know, if you're like me, I grew up not knowing what it is to call anyone dad or daddy or referring to someone as my father. I didn't have that. I literally didn't have that. And for God to call me to himself and to adopt me into his family and said and say that I am now who I am in the spirit and he gives me an identity and I get to bear his name. Um, you know, the ability to not accredit my my earthly father to my heavenly father is one that demonstrates hope. So I I am saved because I know that there is a hope that life can be better than how it began. Life doesn't have to remain as it is presently. I am able to love and I am able to receive love. The hope is that I am not so messed up, so ugly, so dumb, so stupid, so rejected, made so many mistakes that God can't take me and make me something beautiful in his presence. The hope is that because I can forsake myself and I can deny myself and that what I want, I'm going to desire, uh, what God want is what I'm going to desire more than I, what I want. And I am going to begin to read his word and well acquaint myself with the words and the promises that he has made me as now if, as a child of his and believe that you know, I, I, who I presently am, who he created me to be, who he has formed me to be, and I can't be anything different from what he has made me to be. And as I give myself and deny myself more and, and, and trust him, the hope is that he restores me. He, he, he transforms me and he saves me. So we have, we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. It's not hope for what a man sees. Why does he yet hope? So in the, in the beginning of this conversation, I, I, I just shared the, the experience that I had with my Abba, which is give me your hand. And to be able to do that, not having a clue, he didn't, he didn't give me another follow, follow, follow up thought that said, okay, when you give me your hand, I'm going to give you glitter or you're going to see fire or you're going to, um, see diamonds or your hand is going to glow or you're going to receive uh in the spirit what's going to manifest in the natural i have no idea what i received but you guys i know it's something that's going to manifest and it's going to be a testimony soon in the name of jesus that is the hope but god says that when we live like that not only does it purify us it draws us closer to him and it makes us more like him to the point that we can even smell like god sometimes um, we can be, we can be so knitted to him that he allows us to see certain things that other people aren't privy to seeing. But if I have, but if I could see what I'm hoping in, if I say, Hey, I want this, but I know exactly how it's going to work. And I go after it. Like think about Abraham. Many of us are familiar with Abraham's record and testimony. Abraham waited many, 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 many years, decades for this promised son, Isaac, went through some trial and error, got Ishmael, went through some adversities, and got and God, in every step of the way, had to direct his path as he acknowledged him. 
And God eventually follows through with the promise because God's words never return to him void. Neither is he a truce breaker. I love that. That's why we cannot be truce breakers. When you say that you're going to do something, don't be a fool that utters vain words. Be, a, be someone who can be true and faithful with what you have promised. That's my God. And that's what he teaches his people. So we can never be considered liars. So Abraham now has this son and he's had him for about 12 years or so. And now God wants to prove Abraham, trust Abraham. Where's your heart? Who really has your heart? Who really is in control of your life? Who's the author and the finisher of your faith? Who's in control of all of this that we're doing? You know, Abraham is in a position to prove that because we can speak many beautiful, awesome, amazing things about ourselves. And yet it's just so not who we are. It's just what we want to be. It's what we want to present it to society. It's what we want to communicate to our community. It's what we want to be in our family. And so we'll say things about ourselves. But I love how God is so, so holy that he doesn't just want you to speak those things that aren't as though they were. He wants you to become what you're saying and professing yourself to be. And so many of the times he puts us through the fire to prove us, he allows us to go through measures of temptations to ensure us and to establish us. Abraham, I want you to perform a sacrifice today. And I want you to offer Isaac, your promised son, whom you waited and prayed for, to me. We know later in the New Testament that Abraham's hope was I know God didn't make me promises that I was going to have descendants as numerous as the SARS and, and things like that. And they were going to populate the earth just for it to not come into fruition. That doesn't make sense. That's why we have to know the word of God so that we don't, so that we don't fashion a idol of what God is that doesn't match his identity and his pers her, his personality. So Abraham to some degree has been walking with God and has learned how God is, is meek and lowly. The word of God said, learn of me, Jesus Christ. I am meek and lowly. So Abraham has walked enough with God to know that he is a meek and lowly God and that what he is doing is to establish a strongly rooted people that have real faith, real love, real hope for him and for others that cannot be shaken or removed due to circumstances. So Abraham follows through, man, every step of the way. I don't know what God is doing. Give me your hand, Cynthia. I don't know what God is saying. Just do you believe you want what he has? I don't know how this is going to end, but the conclusion is connected to the promises that are already laid up for me. So there's only me winning. There's only a victor victory. There's only prosper prosperity right now at the end of whatever this situation is. God knows. God knows because he's in control of all of this. So Abraham puts Isaac down. The hope is not seen. I have no clue. What's going to happen? But I trust God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidences of things not seen. I cannot say I believe in God. I trust in God. My hope is in God. But yet I know how things are going to happen. You got to not know how things are going to work out. You got to be like Peter, standing in a place where it may seem more secure than what God is asking you to do and, and want to be so close to God, want to be so near to God. You want to defy the odds. You want to come against every natural uh, limitation. You want to come against every scientific reason and say, Jesus, if, you, if it's you, call me out of this boat. And you got to have the hope to know, listen, I know what, I know what the laws of nature say that you aren't supposed to be able to do this but if Jesus says to come to him the hope is that however he's going to make it work is going to work and I'm going to come to him the substance of things hoped for the evidence of not, things not seen hope is not hope if I could see the end result or if I could see how it works so Abraham would not be considered a friend of God or righteous if he knew before he committed the sacrifice. It, it would be a totally different situation. It would not be a credit to him as righteous. If God in the same breath said, Abraham, sacrifice your son Isaac. But upon right when you're about to perform the sacrifice, I'm going to tell you, wait, no, 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 no. I got a ram in a bush for you. Now go up there, build an altar and, and, and sacrifice your son Isaac. That's not hope. That's not faith. And sometimes that's what we're doing. And we're calling it hope and faith. We're, we're taking life. And things that can be reasoned with or 
things that we can rationalize in our minds, stamp the holy God on it and say, oh, I have faith because I paid this bill, but you worked overtime. I have faith because I got my healing. I need it. But you took that medicine and you went through these procedures. That's not faith. That's not hope. Faith is when you cannot see. You have no idea and there's no explanation behind it. It's the miraculous hand of God. Hope is knowing that something's available to you, even though you don't know what that is. I love it. It's interesting how God operates. And as people of God, we got to know. That in order for us to be connected to him, we have to be like-minded with him. So I've got to know what my life as a believer, as a son of God, ought to look like. And how I'm supposed to maneuver throughout the days. I might not like my situation. I might not like the emotions that are connected with my associations. But my decisions, my dispositions, my conclusions have to say to the spirit of God and to the heavenly host that, you know, Cynthia is someone who hopes in God and I don't have to broadcast it to everybody what I'm doing. I just got to know that God is depositing and feeding and filtering what I need to be made whole, what I need to be clean and established in him. And as I remain in him and I'm continually denying myself because he is good and I am unworthy. He's the one that makes me holy and righteous. I I give more of who I am to God. So that goes to the promises that God can make us. Someone, my husband made a promise to me when we were getting married. And a couple of other people have made promises to me throughout my life. My mom had made me a promise a couple of years ago, and I believed her. My husband, at the day of our our um marital ceremony made we made vows to one another and we promised each other specific things that can exemplify a relationship with god like this is to the end this is a, requiring endurance perseverance dedication sacrifice determination effort all of the above all of the above love forgiveness mercy understanding, compassion, compromise, all the things that we're going to need also to relate to the relationship that we have with our father. And so that's why it's, it could be so destructive and so disturbing to your walk with God when we can't have certain relationships that ought to work when we are people of God, not work as it should. It's like, what's the disconnect? And so when certain promises were made to me throughout my lifespan, what it did for me was secure me and make me feel accepted. It made me feel loved. It made me feel wanted. It made me feel valuable. So when you hear certain specific promises from God, like be strong and of a good courage, go and possess this land that I told you is yours. We could read certain measures of Deuteronomy 30. We can go into the end of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 31, maybe when Moses was just about to conclude his ministry in this world and he was about to transfer the role to joshua i'm old you know i've, I've walked with you guys and now i'm not, i'm not gonna be able to go any further than where we are this is moses talking to the assembly of god but he tells joshua to do certain things yeah and let me just look look brief hold on you guys follow me because i have a whole thought process and I'm going to connect it beautifully like a puzzle. And we're going to end up with a beautiful picture at the end of this conversation, I promise you. So in Deuteronomy 31, I want to say, let's start at, let's start at verse 4. And we're just going to run right into it, okay? And then the Lord shall do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, king of the Amorites, and to the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord gave them up to before your face that you may do to them according to all the commandments which I have commanded you. Moses is talking to the people of God. So this is Joshua's commissioned. He says, be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them for the your Lord, your God. He it is that does go before you and he will not fail you nor forsake you. All right. 
And Moses called to Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give you, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, it is he that does go before you, and he will be with you. He will not fail you, neither forsake you. Fear not, neither be dismayed. God says that all throughout the scripture. You can read that promise that he'll never leave or forsake us in the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. It's something that he repetitively wants us to rehearse and to know of him. As we remain and abide in him and believe in him and obey and submit to him, he will never leave nor forsake us. And the promises for the backsliders or the sinners or the rebellious ones that are still gone astray is that if you will confess him at Lord as believe in your mouth, make confession with your mouth that he is God and ask him to forgive you of your sins he cleanses you and but also receives you so even with that there's a promise that he will receive you so you'll never be left to yourself you'll never be forsaken you'll never be outcast that way and so that's a promise to God for all who will believe on his name for all who loves him with his with their whole heart their mind, their soul, and their strength, and are able to show the love of God through them, through actions displayed to others. That's a promise that we hold on to. That, that kind of promise, what it does is do things like, okay, God, you can have my hand. Because you said you're not going to allow me to slip. You said I'm not going to fail. You said I'm not going to be overtaken. You know, um, and even when Peter got out of the boat and he started to walk on water, when he began to lose sight of the fact that God is strong and is able to deliver, even yet when he sunk, when he called out to Jesus, Jesus extended his hand, corrected him, and made sure his perspective was right. Why did you doubt? Do not doubt. Even in that, there's a helping hand of God that will make sure that you don't get destroyed in the mistakes that we're making that shows that God is holy, that God is available, that God is near, and he's involved and wants to be more involved, and he's in control, and he wants to lead us into everlasting life. But we've got to be willing to not just extend our hands, but extend our hearts to God, extend our hearts to God. There has been many times where I've heard people of God going through a lot of marital issues that failed or friendships that were broken or other relationships that just suffered a lot of hardship. And a lot of times you can you can interact with these people that are talking about these broken relationships or in, or experiences with other people, and they're like people that are filled with grace and anointing and power of God, and they're very knowledgeable. And so that that causes you to consider like, well, then if 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 the people if people could be so whole if people could be so anointed. And God can move through people mightily. You can even um, go into a, a church setting and just feel the, the presence of God, y'all. Have y'all, you know, I know, I know people that are near to me that just knows what it is to worship in spirit and in truth and, and experience God every single time we call on his name. But I don't know about you. I don't know if you have ever attended a ministry where the, the, the presence of God was a, was, was evident. Like, oh no, God is here. You just feel him. He might as well just be sitting next to you and you, and, and you, you, you can hear him. Someone told me recently that when they first visited our, our, our local congregations gathering of worship, that when as soon as they entered they knew that they would they would have to do whatever it took to get back here and make this their 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 home to serve God they said they walked into the house of God and although it was maybe less than a hundred people there they in worship it was like they heard thousands of voices echoing in the in the atmosphere and, and it was so supernatural for the person that the person began to make different changes and decisions and make sacrifices to ensure that they can make this a, 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 a common thing in their life. Like, oh no, I've got to, I've got to let this be something that I do on a continual basis. I can't experience something like that and just let it go. I can't know that this is available to man and, and not, not jump in or walk through this open door that is now made available to me like what 
What kind of person would do that? What kind of person would know a million dollars is available to them? Just take it. It's yours. It's not theft. It's not illegal. It's yours and not take it. How much more the presence of God? I've heard that, but you, you can, you can have those experiences where people are doing this, but yet have a, have in the same, in the same way, people just fall away from the presence of God. Just walk away from the house of God, walk away from the assembly of God. They're not denying that the presence of God was active. Everyone knows had, or, or have experienced the hand of God to some degree, whether it was healing or hearing prophecy or experiencing measures of God's touch and, and how your body will respond to the touch of God or, or the, the touch of an angel that just like holy visitation, but they just still walk away. And when I hear things like that commonly and globally around the world, it reminds me of how, as we have hope in God, that God is doing good things for us. We also have to have the heart and the mind of Christ also that is gentle, that is meek and lowly and, and giving and forbears and doesn't vaunt itself and, and believes all things, hopes all things in the name of Jesus, like first Corinthians would say, and doesn't keep record of wrong. I can't just be anointed. I can't just have supernatural encounters and visitations with God. I can't just perform miracles like we might meet people on the on the side of the road performing miracles like like this like God is here to just perform like a magini a genie or a magician. We can experience people that are anointed. We can experience churches that have anointed ministers that can usher the presence of God, but people still feel like, yeah, I know, I know God is here, but I can't stay here. Why? Because there's a lack of the love of God. And I've learned that, man, you can have, you can have security, but if you don't have love, it's not good enough. That's why you can hear, you can hear that with celebrities, but you can hear people well off, like spouses making money and paying for another spouse's lifestyle and taking care of the children be but be unavailable and there's this void and the void is enough for the spouse who's being taken care of financially and is comfortably naturally to leave why because it's not good enough to just supply the need without the love God, when we experience him, he doesn't just supply our needs according to his riches and his glory. He engrafts us and he says, I'm yours and you are mine. And we feel the love of God. And that's why he can chastise us and correct us and restore us because it's the love of God that perfects us. So without, without the corrections of God and the move of God and the love of God, it's not whole. It's not a whole experience. So I'm learning just like marriages can fail because of a lack of love, although everything else is available or friendships can be broken, not because that they weren't to some degree friends, but if there begins to be something that breaks the trust or the bond, this relationship cannot be maintained or retained. And so that's teaching me as I grow in my hope of God and my hope in God and know that he's doing good things in my life in spite of what it feels, in spite of what I have experienced in my past. God is leading me in a place where victory is my identity in the name of Jesus. I got to incorporate the love of God in all that I do moving forward. The body of Christ has to incorporate the love of God as they serve the people of God. You can sing beautiful songs to, to the Lord or or in, in worship, but interacting with you, if I don't feel like you love me, that's not enough to retain me. That's people. That's people because people are, are, are designed to worship. The Bible says that we were created to worship God in order to worship God. There has to be a love that, that you have that connects with God that makes it in spirit and in truth. I'm connected to be interdependent. I'm connected to want companionship. That's why God can look at Adam in the garden and said, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not that he won't survive. 
It's not that he's not going to feed himself. It's not that he's not going to clothe himself. It's not that he doesn't have God to speak to and inter interact with. It's not like he can't make one of these animals a close companion in life. Like some people can have pets and they're single and, and that works for them. But God understands how he fashioned and framed us. And he wants us to understand how to operate as a community, as a body. That's why we're considered a, a body and we have to be fitly joined together. Everything, every joint has to supply in order for this body to function healthily. So if the heart doesn't operate like it should with the love of God, it doesn't matter that I'm functioning in other areas. Something is going to be lacking and something's going to break down in the name of Jesus. So it's all understanding that as I serve God, it's no coincidence that I have to love him with my heart, my soul, and strength. Don't worship or bow yourself to any other idols and love your neighbors at yourself. Like that was, that was very strategic and on purpose with God. Your service to God has to be one filled of faith and hope and surrenderance to him. But it also has to be displayed through our charity and our deeds in the name of Jesus. Because as powerful as I want to believe that I am, as mighty as you believe that you are, if you lack love, then you are like, let's read 1 Corinthians. Because 1 Corinthians can say it prettier than I can. So we're just going to read it like, like Paul left it for us. Because he's just so articulate and so profound, that Paul. He's so, he's so anointed. When you read him, you feel like you just came from a spiritual buffet. Like, I'm so full. I need to go take a nap. <laughs> so he says, he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And he said, though I speak with many tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. I'm going to read that again. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, which is love with action. I am, I am become as sounding brass in a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding of mysteries and all knowledge, and though I, ha I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, y'all, and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and it is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunts not itself. It's not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeks not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinks no evil. Thinks about no wrong. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes. That's my word for the day. Hope bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. So therefore it endures all things. Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall stop. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that is, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly. But when the face to face, now I know in part. But when shall I know even as also I am known? And now abides faith, hope, charity. These things, but the greatest between the three is charity. I hope you grabbed every single thing that I said because the excellence of the love of God is what keeps people patient with you. I'm almost willing to say that because sometimes we can have it backwards. Oh, I prophesy, so I'm valuable to you. You're, you're not going to leave me. I can break down scriptures. You're not going to leave me. I am benevolent and I'm hospitable and I'm giving to you. You need me because you might need some gas money. You might need some food. You might need me to gift you on your birthday. I'm a birthday person. You might want me to give you a word right now in the name of Jesus. I have the anointing. I have the, the resources. I have the grace to do all these things. I'm almost willing to say that most people will forsake that and in exchange for pure, sincere love. When I was younger... 
And I mean it when I said it, and I mean it today in the name of Jesus. When I began, when my husband and I decided that we were going to be official, I told him it doesn't matter what we go through in life and where we end up, I'm always going to be with you, and I live in a box with you. And it's like, make sure we don't end up in no box. But if we do end up in a box, it's just me and you against the world. And we have gone through life on our own and have experienced it low things and we have experienced measures of successes in life both out of the lord and in the lord in the name of jesus and we've been able to overcome many things and i want to say one of the key components of the bond that we have together is not how how handsome i think he is or how beautiful he think i am because that stuff is vain it vanishes with time it's not how much money he has in the bank account or what he can do for me because that stuff can be taken away in a drop of a dime it's not about his health because god forbid something happens for him to him he's still the man i fell in love with and i'm going to love him it's the love that kept me with him and he with me. It's the love. It wasn't the stuff. It wasn't what he can perform. It wasn't what he had access to that and that kept me close to him. Same thing with friends, friends that I've had for years. It wasn't what they can do for me that allowed me to keep them close to me. It was the the faithfulness and the devotion in their and their giving of themselves that has allowed for me to consider them as friends and to keep them near and dear to me. We don't care about those other things. Most of us can agree it's not about the money. It's not about the stuff. It's not about the talent or the gifts. It's the heart I really want. I got to know I trust you. I got to know I love you. I got to know if I call you, you'll answer me. I got to know you're going to help me in time of need. I, I got to know that you're not going to allow me to do something crazy to d destroy myself. I got to know if, if, if it needs to be, you'll be hard on me and to, to get me right. I got to know that you love me and I can't question the love that you have for me because that's the bond that keeps us together. Um, Ephesians talks about that keeping us in that bond of you i mean i'm the lord is all over the all over the place to us today in the name of jesus if i could find that real quick in the name of jesus in the name of jesus lord help me find it real quick it's the it's the spirit of unity and the bond of peace somebody oh found it I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There, peace. There is one body. There is one Spirit. Even as you are called in one hope. That's how I know I'm led by the Lord today, y'all. Of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to every one of us is given grace according to the measure and the gift of Christ. I love it. We have to endeavor to keep the unity in the spirit in the, of the bond of peace. That's what causes a community to thrive. That's what builds a family. That's what keeps relationships healthy, you guys. In the name of Jesus. So the, the vanity, the carnality, the carnal minds that, that we can have that causes us to escape the deep truth of serving God in spirit and in truth, we need to employ again. We need to search out and, and receive and hold fast again in the name of Jesus so that we don't lose precious things along the way. So we don't discard precious things along the way thinking that they're not valuable when they are valuable. Everything, every person that God gives to you is valuable and strategic and that's why he gives the people and the things to you. It's for you to, to steward and we got to be good and faithful stewards of the Lord that can enter into the rest of the Lord in the name of Jesus. So I extended my hands today. Why? Because my Abba Father asked me to. And I didn't ask him no questions like, well, what? tell me first what's in your hand. Why did I not ask God? Because I have a hope that he loves me and he wants me to succeed. So when he talks to me, when he, such, such an important holy God, comes to visit me in my living room, Room, even though he's always with me and says, Hey, Cynthia, give me your hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because I am weak 
And I am nothing without God. So in this hour, thank you, God. You see me. You see me. You remember me. Who am I that you are so mindful of me? I, 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 I praise and appreciate God that he is so mindful of me because I am nothing. But to him, I'm precious and I'm his daughter in the name of Jesus. So here you can have my hand. And, and, and I thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for what you put in my hands. So I don't know. I don't know if you want to walk by faith with me today. I don't know if you are willing to walk in some hope in the Lord today. But I want to believe that God wants to do things not just for me, but for you too. It's interesting how God will hide nuggets and treasures just for the hungry and the thirsty to find it. He said, blessed are the hungry and the thirsty, for they shall be filled. A lot of people in these types of conversations don't make it this far. And I think God does it on purpose because the spirit of God likes to filter through all of the vanity. So I want to say today that whatever God is doing in the spirit isn't just for me. It's for you too, because he's allowing me to say these things. So by faith, open your hands. Don't make any petitions. Because we don't know what we ought to pray for as we should. So that's why the Holy Spirit makes in holy intercessions for us with moanings and groanings and travailings. So this is not the moment to be particular or have a perspective. Give yourself wholly to God right now in the name of Jesus. Give him your hand. And I want to say lift up your heart to God and receive what he knows you need. You need some things. You need some things. And he is here to supply what you need because what you need and, that, and what he is supplying is going to ensure that you stay on that straight and narrow path and that you get to his bosom. That's the goal, that he can hide us, that we can be hedged, that we can be kept in the hands of the father so that we can be so close that we can hear his still small voice. So extend your hands, extend your heart. Don't utter a word. Just be a grateful believer, follower, child of God, and allow him to replenish you of what you lost. Allow him to strengthen you of what you've lost. Allow him to regain your hope again because some of it was lost. Allow him to fill you because you need to be a cup that runs over. I feel the presence of God. Let him fill your cup till it runs over in the name of Jesus. Let him do it. Let him do it. Let him do it. And don't quench the spirit of God. Don't frustrate the spirit, the presence of God right now. By faith, receive that God is giving you the heart that you need to love him in such a way that you can demonstrate it in your actions. By faith, believe that you are going to, you are so sacrificial and dedicated to God that if he asks you for your Isaac, that you will give it to him because you know that he's controlling everything anyways. And this is his world. I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm just his, his beloved in whom he is trying to prepare a new earth for. So what he's requiring of me is a deposit into my eternity. It's an investment to my everlasting. So what I have now that God wants, it's not so he can tear my heart apart. It's not that he can destroy me and go through more hardship that I've already experienced in this life. It's that he's trying to increase you. He's trying to bless you. And we've got to be willing to give more to God. Give him more so that he can make you who he had formed you in your mother's womb to be in the very beginning in the name of Jesus. So I, 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 I receive, I receive, I receive, I receive, I receive grace. I receive grace to be patient. I, I, I don't, I don't know what God is doing for you, but me, I receive grace to be patient, grace to be righteous grace to be faithful grace to endure until the end grace to be a servant of the lord most high i want to serve in any form however god wants it and i want it to be sincere i receive the grace i receive i don't know what you want but i know that god is looking for a heart for that can worship him in spirit and in truth i don't know what you're looking for 
But I know that the people of God is looking for a city with that, that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I don't know what you prefer or what you prioritize, but I do know that God will pass you by if you're not hungry for him because he's looking for the hungry and the thirsty to fill. I don't know what's causing you to be afraid of God, but he does say you got to taste and see that he is good. He's a gracious and merciful God. I don't know what you got going on in your life that can keep you from an almighty God, but he is long suffering. He's kind and he is coming back for a ready people. And we don't know when that time or that hour is, and we don't have as much time as we may think or want to have in the name of Jesus. I don't know if you're willing to let him pass you by. I don't know if you're willing to lay down your life, but I do know God is here. I do know the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I do know the spirit of God is upon me. I do know God is moving and ministering in the earth and the hungry and the thirsty will search for him and find him. And I pray that you are among the number in the name of Jesus and that you become one of the laborers that can gather more sheep into the sheepfold of the Lord God so that he can crown you with his glory. There is a crown to those who endure and live righteously, a crown of life in the name of Jesus. I believe in the Lord always. I believe him. I love him. And I want to and I want to know how to love him in a more perfect way. I'm not there yet, but that is my desire. I want to believe him at every word that he says. I'm not there yet, but that is my desire. I want to be able to be so giving, so forgiving, so available to not just God but so but to others. So I sit in the presence of God so that he can make me who I need to be, so that he can smile. I want my my God to look down on me and smile. I don't want to just say I'm trying. I want to be succeeding. I don't want to just try. I want to be excellent in God. And the spirit of God in me is 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 not weak. He says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Lord of God says, um, if God be for you, who can be against you? God also says, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. So I am not going to just try. I am going to overcome. I'm not going to just try, y'all. I am going to prosper. I'm not going to just try, you guys. I am going to live and not die. I'm not just going to try, y'all. I'm going to serve the Lord with my whole heart in the name of Jesus. I am going to forgive him, forgive so that he can forgive me. You guys, I'm not just going to speak vain and idle words. I am going to strive to enter in in the name of Jesus. I am and will be on that straight and narrow path in the the name of Jesus. God bless you guys.